start things off, I did ask, I know a few of the folks from the Wellington Behavioral Science um, Meetup, how often do you consciously breathe? And we got a range of answers, um, ranging from daily, um, which was amazing to hear, uh, all the way to never. And most people answered somewhere in the middle and whenever they were reminded to breathe or they were um, maybe some other practices like yoga reminded um, people to breathe. Um, Juliet, I'd like to feel the question to you maybe to start off. Um, how often do you uh, practice conscious breathing? And are there any specific practices which you've tried or you like? Yes, yeah, so um, I would say I'm not a good breather uh, and I've actually tried to work a lot on it, which is, but I think that's good in terms of reflecting on how to, uh, you know, reshape the environment, so to speak, which will go through to, uh, breathe better. So I, um, <clears throat> when I was born, actually, my lungs collapsed. So I always had trouble breathing up until I was about 18 or 19. Um, and then since then, I uh, have had some tests every um, few years just to make sure my lungs are still okay. And I breathe more than a normal person. But I'm definitely a mouth breather. And it is something that since um, reading the book Breathe, I've really been trying to uh, change. So um, if any of you would love to read a really fascinating book, um, it's called um, Breathe and it um, basically talks about the benefits of breathing through your nose and the fact that um, and when you breathe through your nose, you know, you filter out a lot of the, 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 the filth in the air, so to speak, and it has much, much better benefits from you um, from a, a health perspective, from kind of a psychological perspective than breathing through your mouth. So um, some of the things that I've been trying and I literally have tried to take my mouth shut when I'm when I'm sleeping um, or when I go for walks, I try and walk uh, for, for periods of times just breathing through my nose. The thing I've really struggled with is remembering to breathe in the moment. Um, and I'd love to hear people's strategies of, of this. So I had a, a breathing coach for a year. And what I really tried to work with her on, which um, is how do I remember to breathe right before I go on stage? So sometimes when I start, I'm speaking, I'm really good. And other times you can hear the nervousness in, in my breath. So we would practice breathing like boxing and so trying to get my body into the habitual state of kind of stress and anxiety to then um, learn how to breathe uh sometimes still very useful but also now that COVID has happened and I've been two years out of kind of practice of face-to-face -face presenting and that cue kind of base presenting uh, I think um, there's there's plenty of work there so that's my very broad overview Yes. Uh, so I'm so excited to share this episode. I know when we just uh, conceptualized this idea of well-being by design as a way to connect practitioners with well-being tools so that we can embed into our own lives, but also so that we're more capable to go out there and help others. Breathing was like the first topic which was on my mind. Um, so <laughs> super excited that we can share the space um, for, some, for, for some breathing techniques. Um, I have been conducting a few work, a few breathwork workshops. Um, my, um, I kind of say that I'm training to become a, bre a breathing um, coach if, uh, the, if, if that needs training, because I also like to make the case that we were born breathing, <laughs> but maybe some of the act of conscious breathing has fallen out of practice. But there, um, I think what I really like about breathwork is it's super accessible. It's um, available with us at all times. Um, I know James Nestor says it in his book that we take about, um, we breathe about 20,000 times a day. And um, in an average life's lifespan, that's about 670 million breaths. Um, and if we can um, take more nourishing breaths, and if you start maybe experiencing some of the impact of taking these nourishing breaths, um, I think that's a life well lived. Um, it's very hard to summarize some of the benefits of breathing. Um, I think a lot of it is best understood through um, through experience and through and th and through practice. Um, so maybe instead of maybe of exploring all the benefits of breathing, we can maybe um, I have two two experiences um, in my mind, and we can maybe explore how we can embed some of these uh, practices into our lives. Um, the first one being. Um, some, de some deep diaphragmic breaths. Um, so this idea of taking slow, deliberate, conscious breaths. 
and we can practice it together. We can take about maybe um, 10 of these breaths together. The idea is to take deep inhales. So we can, um, you can like place um, your right, right hand or left hand on your belly. And as you take these deep inhales, you can feel your belly expand as you inhale through the lungs. And as you, as you take these breaths, take longer exhales. So we'll take shorter deep inhales. So about a three second inhale. And about a five second exhale. And allow your belly, love your belly to expand as you inhale and contract as you exhale. And we'll take about three more of these breaths together. So a deep inhale and long, slow exhale. And you can return to your normal breath and allow yourself to feel to feel good that you just gave yourself a couple of minutes to just switch off and breathe. Um, I think some of the interesting um, and also al alarming statistics is the average person breathes about 18 times a minute. Um, and if we can move towards four, about five to six breaths a minute is what's the ideal recommended uh, breathing. It of course changes from time to day and um, the activity which you're participating in. And we have this amazing ability to actually consciously manipulate our breaths through the diaphragm. So while we take these um, deep um, deep inhales, we, uh, we actually get to flex our diaphragmic muscles. So it's literally a muscle underneath our lungs and as we inhale, the, the diaphragm literally collapses and allows the lungs to expand. And as we exhale, the diaphragm kind of goes up and the lung contracts. And as we gain more and more control over our diaphragmic breaths, they have a whole range of benefits from regulating our heartbeat to managing uh, stress and managing anxiety, right up to even um, feeling, feeling more alert when we'd like. And one of the big, one of the big uh, ideas around any breathing or meditation practice is um, this idea to allow ourselves moments of introception. So there's a language of introception and extraception. Extraception being how we um, sense the world around us. So we take in all these sensory inputs right from sounds and, to, and from, from our visual cues through, uh, through smells. And we spend a lot of time outside our own heads and outside our own minds and outside our own bodies. And the practice of um, breathing and a lot of meditation practices start with breath work. Um, allows us to connect with our own selves or our own bodies, and it allows us moments to check in with ourselves. And this ability to manipulate our introception and extraception. Um, plays plays a big a big role in terms of how we interact um, with the world around us and can really change our mood and how we feel. So it's an awesome cue to be able to switch between at will to be able to switch between the, these um, introception and extraception states. Um, I think from a psychological perspective as well, when you breathe it allows you to a it's something that you can often control so in a lot of stressful situations people find 
breathing more. Um, it, it can help you direct your emotions, right, and, and control your emotions more. But it gives you an ability of being able to have a sense of control, but also a sense of presence of actually stopping and, and thinking about your emotional um, awareness, so, which, you know, leads to emotional intelligence as well, not even in a crisis situation, but in many situations, like stopping and having those periods of time where you concentrate on your breathing, which actually makes you much more perceptive as well to your, um, to your additional physiology. And then by emotions, it's not just physiology, it's how we label the situation. You can change that label in the emotion, in, in, the, in the moment. Um, there's a lot of benefits there. I have um, a question then, Vishal, for you, because it's something that I really struggle with, as I said. I'm very good at breathing at certain times, and I, I love the kind of box method where you just do the four in, four out, out. like so, hold four, so breathe in for four, hold for four, breathe out for four. Um, you know, hold for four, breathe in for four. And that for me um, is very useful. I can't do the really long ones. Uh, I can do quick ones, but I um, am quite jittery in general. So it's more I need it to calm down than I need it to kind of pump me up. Um, but how do, you, how do you regulate your breathing in high stress situations? And how do you control that? Because I think that's quite a difficult one and something that I, I think a lot of people, I'm going to make this huge assumption, may struggle with. So when you're under a highly anxious time point, how do you actually control your breathing? Yes, I was going to add that you're um, possibly not yet good at um, those other practices and the power of yet um, um, and neuroplasticity, plasticity, which actually allows us to, um, to get us there. Uh, that, that's an amazing question. And um, Part of a part of relaxation, so the long exhales um, help with help with relaxation. So the practice which we did around shorter inhales and longer exhales helps us go from our, um, our, our, our uh, if we're in a operating with our sympathetic um, nervous system, it allows us to deregulate that, and we suddenly act we reactivate um, the parasympathetic nervous system, which um, allows us a sense of calm. The quickest evidence-based strategy, and there's quite a lot of um, um, peer-reviewed papers suggesting um, the effectiveness of four double sighs. Um, so it's also called the psychological sigh. And the practice essentially involves taking um, a double inhale, so hence double sigh, almost like you're sighing, so, and a long, slow exhale. But like practically, how does that, because sometimes I feel these breathing strategies, uh, and I'm going to be the like critic here, right, really useful to do when you've got time in the moment to think about. But I think about it sometimes before, like say presentations, as I said. So something like I do is like run upstairs and that helps me open my lung capacity and then I'll, so, so sometimes too, or like, how do you remind? So as behavioral scientists, like, you know, do you put a cue on your, do you have like a reminder in your diary that says quick breathe? I know that actually, I think you do do this. It's part of your habitual behavior. I have like signs that I say breathe or I, or I think about clicking a pen. So if I think I'm speaking too quickly, I will think about like clicking my pen. I won't actually click it. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, rambling right now but i find it really useful to think yes. about strategies like that but the cues in the moment or the cues throughout your day to build that habitual behavior of breathing yes. but also to build breathing in a high stress situation like what are those reminders that you utilize in yes that, that's a really good question i literally have time blocks in my day where i just put like 15 minutes of breathing um, i think it's allowing yourself time to do it and then you don't feel guilty about the practice because hang on that was my 15 minutes of breathing um there's um i, I think the two i think the two layers to it one is um like you pointed out having those cues and reminders um through your day so before uh, um, before i'm conducting a workshop i have um 15 minutes blocked out just to allow myself to breathe and sometimes it's on the way while i'm heading to the workshop then i do those like when i don't have enough time i do the four um, double inhale, long exhales. Um, this, 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 the second um, being to create, to, to make it more of a routine, to feel good about it. 
an aspect of, okay, this practice works. Um, this practice is helping me. And this ties in with a lot of the habit change models. Um, to, make a, to make a habit last, uh, it's important to create those cues and those routines um, and those reminders. But it's also important to celebrate those habits and to celebrate times you're doing things well. So if you do find, if you did find a breathing routine work well for you before you conduct a, le a lecture, for example, tell, tell your friend about it and tell your friend how amazing it made you feel because it will remind yourself about the practice which you've adopted and you kind of make a mental commitment to yourself then to follow through with that practice. And the next time you're in that situation to, um, to yeah, to just allow yourself a moment to breathe. Yeah, look, I recently read an article about um, some effective strategies of uh, so some effective some strategies that effective leaders use. And there was this study that was done across Asia Pacific. They um, sampled over ten thousand leaders. They ended up just studying the behaviour of about twenty very influential leaders. And one of the things that they found is, and it's not specifically breathing like um, associated, but a lot of people built in. Uh, reflection in the morning and the afternoon and part of that reflection for some individuals was breathing. Um, the other aspect that they had uh, that I read was, and there's two people did this and this is a very small sample size, but I thought this was quite interesting, is between meetings they have post-it notes that tell them how to turn up to that meeting um, and, po and one of them had post-it notes that also like talked about how they might breathe before that meeting. So um, in the meeting, so if they needed to come in high energy for something, their breathing strategies uh, would be very different and their reminder would be, you know, you need to turn up to this meeting high energy. Uh, in other meetings, they would have the flag that obviously said, um, you know, you need to be much more serious or controlled here. And I thought that was really interesting when I was reading through it, particularly coming up to this uh, podcast, is those cues to just before each meeting had these postcards that they plan, I mean postcards, um, post-it notes that they planned in the morning of how they needed to actually turn up to meetings. And then strategies, one of them had a strategy around breathing within that as well. Yes, and I'm, I'm reflecting in the roles as well, you know, whether it's biz business leaders and designers and um, um, behavioral um, practitioners, we are often, designing interventions and designing programs and policies which impact real people's lives. And the importance and value of, um, um, of, em of being more empathetic towards people we're designing, for, uh, designing with. And I think a way, a way to empathy and quite often we're so pressurized to you know, deliver within this deadline we don't allow ourselves a moment to breathe. So I think it makes incredible sense in workshops and you know, co-design sessions when we're designing with people to, to actually put in those moments of reflection, um, those moments of stop and let's, let's maybe pause from this brainstorming task. I know it's going really well, but we've been doing it for about 90 minutes. So maybe let's take a pause and let's take a few minutes to just breathe and there's a good amount of evidence suggesting that um, um, whether it's breathing practices, but also some of the meditation practices like a loving kindness practice leads us to becoming more compassionate for people which we're designing, um, which we're designing for. So I think we're, yeah, we're missing out a whole, even though it's not classified as, you know, business as usual, or it may not be part of our agenda. I think we should be pushing these practices within within our agendas, within workshops, within meetings, uh, and versus isolating it so that people are left to do it on their own um, at, at their own time. Yeah, it is interesting about then organizational design around breathing. So if there is a strong research that knows breathing is um, you know, much better for you than mouth breathing. Obviously, there'll be individual differences, and that's another really interesting topic. Um, if it's that, um, you know, you do see these benefits of self-awareness and stopping. So in one of the MBA courses I teach around communication, we get somebody in for the week six guest lecture that actually uh, gets people to sit down and put their feet on the ground and think about, you know, different breathing strategies, which is really fantastic. There, there could be this argument around, you know, why aren't organisations really focusing on concentrating on on training their leaders uh, with breath work? I mean, I've seen the laughing 
uh, workshops now. So the laughing milkshake where it kind of gets people to, to breathe. I don't know if anyone's seen this, but it's one of those wellness strategies so around, again, laughing. You release endorphins. Um, if you're around other people, you're much more likely to laugh. It obviously opens up your capacity to to breathe and so there's these workshops now but also it started you know overseas and there's research around the benefit of these kind of laughing milkshakes so they get you to like put different ingredients in your milkshake and then you got to shake it but well you're also like you know the, I, I remember when I first saw it I was at Commonwealth Bank and, and I was just like what is going on over there so um hilarious in in some ways but really interesting to think about in well-being strategies that corporate organisations put together uh, something around breathing isn't usually there. It's more around, you know, um, calendar design or, or something like that um, versus actually breath work and well-being. Yes, it should definitely be in the centre of things. I'm quite, I'm quite um, interested to maybe go through another practice um, for us to experience another dimension. So we did, we did uh, I did mention the language of introception and extraception. And the first practice which we had done was moving and navigating from a more extraceptive state um, to taking those um, long um, exhales, um, which allowed us to connect with ourselves, but also feel a sense of calm. So the long, the long exhales help with calm. Um, an another practice um, is fast breathing. So these are practices which you do, do at times and um, for, for a very specific purpose. Um, these practices could be um, a replacement for a double espresso, literally, because it really moves you from this um, um, calm, relaxed state to maybe a more alert state. Um, some of you may have um, come across some of um, the practices like um, two more breathing or what Wim Hof has, um, uh, Wim Hof has um, pop popular, popularized in his, his own way, which combines fast breathing with um, a cold shower. Um, the practice which we can we can experience, we'll do again about 10 breaths. It's um, from a pranayam practice. That's um, the practice which I'm most familiar with. And the breathing technique is called uh, bastrika breath um, or bastrika pranayam. Bastrika means fire, so it creates a little bit of fire in the belly. Um, a little bit of caution before we experience this practice is um, if you do have vertigo, you've had a stroke recently, um, have high bl blood pressure or any respiratory disease, um, take the practice a bit easy. Um, and if you feel some level of dizziness, maybe return to your normal breathing. It's going to be a short practice, so um, we won't go through a full, a full round. We might do about 10 breaths of these, and I'd love for you to join, join in with me and we can um, experience it together. So the practice involves taking these short inhales. And as we take these inhales, we lift our arms up. And as we exhale, we lift our arm down like you're pulling a rope. So it's like a deep inhale and exhale. And we'll do 10 of these breaths and we'll do it very quickly just to feel alive and to feel awake. Okay, let's go. Deep inhale. Deep inhale and exhale with our mouth. Oh. And you can allow yourself to turn to the sensation of your normal breath. I find these ones are much better for um, just before, again, I, I think of speaking because I've been speaking, but in, in front of. Um, before I go on stage or but not before I go on stage before I give a virtual um, talk so one of the things I've struggled with when I'm virtually speaking is regulating my breath to begin with because it's a different environment than going on stage so different types of struggle with breathing where I think I've been so still for so long that I feel that I'm a bit more uh, rigid Whereas if I, I often, you know, start to move my body while I'm breathing um, just before, you know, and then you can quickly, so you can turn off your camera for a bit. And that to me um, is, is very useful. Or as I said, I've got stairs here and I go for a run up and down the stairs before I 
present particularly virtually just because um, that, you know, it gets your body moving as well as your breath. Yes, it's like it's like having a double espresso and um, I could literally feel my heart. My heart's literally beating so much faster and, you know, you're more more awake and more more alive. James Nestor in his book Breath summarizes it very well. There's as many um, breathing practices as there are um, cuisines and, you know, foods, uh, foods in the world. And there's unique breathing practices for unique moments. Uh, so um, if you are feeling a little low energy and you need, need, need to give a talk, it makes sense to do some of these fast breathing practices. But if you are feeling anxious, um, you may want to, and, and, and you are about, um, maybe there's a fear of public speaking, you might want to do some of the slow breathing practices and that suddenly slows down your heart rate and you're feeling, and you feel really comfortable and really more present um, in the moment. Um, a few, a few people, um, the, the fast, the, um, yeah, a few people don't gel with the fast breathing practices. Um, it's, it's sometimes avoided when, uh, so the fast breathing, what it does is it essentially induces a little bit of stress um, within the body. Um, the idea being that um, st stress is so demonized by, uh, by everyone, but if we're able to introduce very short time, sh short bursts of stress with very fixed time intervals, we, um, we train our neural pathways to better manage and cope up with the stress. So five minutes of stress to the body and uh, being able to regulate it gives us, um, wires the brain and, and, and our neural path pathways to actually cope up and deal with stress much better. Um, quite often we mistake stress um, and we have poor reactions to it. So um, a stressful email, for example, may set a, um, for, from a manager or a, uh, may set our heart racing, um, which doesn't really make sense from a reaction point of view because then we're not um, um, we're not equipped because we 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 we're, we're starting up a fight or flight signal, but we actually need to respond via an email. So it's not the most it's not the most um, uh, helpful response for, from our body. But if we're able to recognize that, wait, hang on, this is kind of like a fast breathing practice, and I can maybe de-stress myself before or do some slow breathing after, I'm going to be able to respond to this person way more compassionately and uh, with an understanding that I don't have to react in a way just because my body is, tr uh, my body is triggered for a specific um, response. Yeah, I wonder, Juliet, what's your maybe go-to strategies for relieving stress? And yeah, do you see breathing potentially playing a role in activating this? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, uh, so I have a, I mean, no, no one here would know this, but um, I've had a paralysed esophagus for the last few years. So sometimes, so for me, it's the slowing down. So it's the box kind of method where you, as I said, breathe in for four, hold for four, breathe out for four, hold for four. So like some, so what will happen is I get food stuck in my esophagus and I can't get it down and it's really, really uncomfortable. So I can't do the high stress state because it will make me even more stressed but I can do the slow. But then again, as I said, when I need energy, actually using my breath quite fast is quite useful for me. So I think it's understanding, trialing different methods and understanding what's best for you and when. And, and really um, part of that is also being self-compassionate. So there are times when I've been trying to practice breathing and then I go on, you know, go on stage and it's not worked at all. And then there's times where it does. So it's just about really continually iterating and, and learning how, breathing works best for you um so i think that is is definitely one i mean i'd love to open it up to everybody and say what are your strategies around breathing but also um you know, what are your questions as well and and what are your practices so maybe they're the three so like maybe we go to the first one first of all does anybody have some really effective breathing strategies that work for them